Uh, welcome. I am uh, Mitch Day, the editor in chief of the Journal of Law and Liberty. And uh, I would like to uh, thank everyone for attending our uh, symposium this morning, uh, which I think has a very uh, topical subject uh, given, given the news. Um, uh, I'd also like to thank the panelists and the keynote uh, speaker for uh, agreeing to participate in our symposium. Um, before I, before I uh, call up Kim to introduce the first panel, if you all will allow me to, to just make a quick plug uh, for the Journal of Law and Liberty. Uh, for those who don't know, uh, we are the first uh, law journal who is dedicated to the development of classical liberal ideas. Um, and if anybody here uh, would like to publish in the journal or publish on uh, our website, uh, please uh, contact me either at this event or shoot me an email um, or uh, contact uh, Nick Gallagher, who is next year's uh, editor-in-chief about publishing. Um, you can also find us on our website, uh, lawandlibertyblog.com. Um, uh, with that, I'd also like to, to thank uh, Laura Creste with the Classical Liberal Institute and uh, Kim Doe uh, for organizing this. Uh, they've put in a lot of time and effort over the last year, really, uh, getting everybody together for this uh, symposium. Um, and with that, uh, I'll invite Kim up to uh, introduce uh, the first panel. Uh, thank you, Mitch. It is my pleasure to introduce the members of our first panel, which will focus on Janus versus AFS CME, argued before the Supreme Court yesterday. Mr. David Schwartz is a partner at the law firm Irel and Manila. He is a member of the litigation practice group with a primary focus on defense of class action. Mr. Schwartz has litigated a wide range of federal and state class actions alleging anti-discrimination claims, unfair labor practices, wage and hour disputes, antitrust, and unfair business claims. Mr. Schwartz's appellate experience in state and federal courts is extensive and includes two matters now before the California Supreme Court as well as numerous appeals pending in the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit and in the California Courts of Appeal. Professor Samuel S. Stryker is a Dwight D. Offerman Professor of Law at NYU School of Law. He is a nationally preeminent scholar in U.S. and international comparative labor and employment law and arbitration law. He has authored more than a dozen books, including Beyond Elite Law, Access to Civil Justice in America, published in 2016, and leading case books on labor law and employment law. He served as chief reporter for the American Law Institute's Restatement of Employment Law in 2015. Professor Leah Palagash Vili is an assistant professor at economics at SUNY Purchase College and the Law and Economics Fellow with the Classical Liberal Institute at NYU Law. She earned her PhD in economics from George Mason University in 2015. And while in graduate school, she was also a visiting PhD scholar with the Department of Economics at New York University. She was recently named one of Forbes 2016 30 Under 30 in law policy. Moderating the panel is Professor Richard A. Estes, who is the inaugural Florence A. Tisch Professor of Law at NYU School of Law. He has many other accolades, including serving as a Peter and Hurston Bedford Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution since 2000, serving as, the mem as a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences since 1985, and winning the Bradley Prize in 2011. Professor Epstein has written numerous articles on a wide range of legal and interdisciplinary subjects, as well as over 15 books. His most recent is The Classical Liberal Constitution, The Uncertain Quest for Limited Government, published in 2014. Uh, with that, Professor Epstein, if you could begin with an introduction of the issues in Janus, and then present our first question to the panel. Okay. Um, what I'm going to do is uh, give a brief background and then ask a provocative question and have each of our panelists take a couple of minutes to answer. Um, in some sense, the origins of Janus does not start yesterday. It probably starts to some extent in 1935 uh, with the adoption of the National Labor Relations Act, which essentially organized a system of collective bargaining for industrial unions in the private sector. And there it remained for a very long period of time until the early 1960s, when in January of 1962, uh, President John Kennedy issued an order uh, which announced that from this time forward, 
on certain issues, federal employees were entitled to collectively bargain against the government, even though this was not required by any statute at that time or indeed any time thereafter. It then followed in the early 1960s a rash of new legislation that came through at the state level, not the federal level, which allowed for the unionization of uh, public employees. The basic bargain struck in this state by, I think it's the Taylor Act, um, was said that yes, you may organize, but no, you may not strike, but you are entitled to have these cases resolved by compulsory arbitration. This system, of course, has been highly contentious both ways, and uh, the question of its validity was came up in a case called the boot against the Detroit Board of Education, uh, which was handed down in 1977, and which has become probably the most cited recent Supreme Court case, given the importance of Janus today, and of course, the earlier Friedrich's case, which in 2016 was mooted out 4-4 with the untimely death of Justice Anthony Scalia. Uh, the basic position that was faced in a boot is the extent to which you could, in a so-called agency shop, uh, require people who were represented by the union to make contributions to the union for its various activities. And the way in which the decision broke down was as follows. Uh, Justice uh, Stewart, writing for a majority, actually unanimous court, with a couple of concurrences here and there, uh, took the basic line that there was an intimacy between two issues that had to be resolved. On the one hand, he thought there was a serious question of collective organization and how could unions could survive if in fact they were required to essentially represent those individuals who were not required to pay any share of the upkeep for what was going on. And this was generally thought to be the so-called free rider article, argument, which has been repeated multiple times since that particular time. And on the other side, he said, given the fact that joining a union is joining an organization that speaks, it turns out that to the extent that you could extract dues from individual members, uh, that would be a form of compelled speech. And the question would then be as to whether or not under the First Amendment, one had a right to opt out. Justice Stewart was always known as a prudent balancer, and Abood is one of the cases that gives him that reputation. Because what he decided to do under these circumstances was to split the difference. And he said that with respect to core functions associated with the business of negotiating and enforcing a collective bargaining decision, he would think that the uh, basic policies that were embodied in the National Labor Relations Act with private employees in the federal sector carried over to public employees um, under state law. And so therefore that uh, these particular charges could be made, charges could be made under the agency shop arrangement which essentially had the union representing people who were not its members. On the other hand, when it came to straight political decisions of one kind or another, he said that the appropriate rule here was to respect the First Amendment issues, and so therefore uh, to deny the union the right to receive monies for those uh, payments. Uh, this situation has been more or less stable, I would say, for about 41 years, but starting about 10, 8, 10 years ago, it became quite clear that uh, sort of a rising level of dissatisfaction uh, to the notion uh, managed to percolate through the Supreme Court. And the two cases that were involved on this thing were a case called Knox and one called Quinn against Harris. And I'll just briefly mention to you what the issues are so that you can see that they're both narrow issues on the one hand and broader issues on the other hand. Uh, the Knox case, which was the first of these two cases from 2012, is a classic situation of how it is that you do the account. You had a situation where a union, I believe it was in California, but it doesn't much matter, uh, was engaged in uh, a special campaign um, in order to engage in serious political activities, which required a special assessment. And the issue in many ways was a technical question as to whether or not everybody had to pay the um, assessment at the front end, and then the books would be balanced later on, and the people who objected to this on political First Amendment grounds would receive a refund, or whether or not you had to prorate at the front end. And you can see it's a timing question, and Justice Alito, who is one of the most unhappy people with respect to the Abu synthesis, said we don't allow interest-free loans under these circumstances, so they challenged the mode of accounting uh, that the union wanted to do. And in the background of this, there was a larger concern as to whether or not the synthesis that had been created in the group ought to be kept in place in any event. 
Two years later, uh, coming out of Illinois, there's a case called Quinn v. Harris, and this is a situation in which the particular issue was whether or not the state for limited purposes could designate home health care workers, including parents of um, children who were A, retarded, and B, over the majority, or became part of a union. And what the state said is, we're your employer only for the purposes of collective bargaining, but we're not your employer for anything else. Uh, so you cannot hold us, for example, vicariously liable for anything that any of our employees happen to do. And, and this is obviously a very Jerry Reed kind of situation, um, because what you're doing now is you're uh, pretending that these people, to some extent, are members of a union, even though there is no obvious workplace that's associated with them and no private employer, no local government. They're highly dispersed individuals. And what happened is the Supreme Court was unhappy with that arrangement, struck it down. And once again, uh, we then were faced with the larger question of what we to do with the boot. Uh, so the way in which we get to the run-up in this particular case is we've had two recent decisions which have expressed genuine uneasiness about the Abood accommodation. And we then had the argument in Friedrichs where it's split 4-4. Um, and when we then had the rerun this time, just yesterday, uh, most people would say, if they looked at the argument, very little new had happened. Everybody was trying to figure out exactly what it was that Justice Gorsuch was going to do. And what he did is he pulled the Clarence Thomas on us, and he did not say a word during the course of argument. So what I'm going to do is going from left to right on the panel is to ask everybody to give uh, sort of a one or two minute uh, statement about what you think about the way in which this case ought to come out, uh, whether you think stare decisis is the appropriate measure, how you weight the two various interests and so forth, and then we'll mix it up a little bit here and there, and as we continue on, uh, more exchange amongst the panels for questions and so forth, and then what we'll do is we'll open it up to questions from the audience. I, I should say that this is an issue which has a certain degree of contentious quality associated about it, um, and so therefore I shall try as improbable as it sounds, uh, to be an impartial moderator. Okay. <laughs> we love you. What, what? Oh, um, I'm going to uh, use my remarks to talk about the economics issues, if that's, if that's, that's right. on the free rider and stuff like that. Mm. Well, go. Oh, do you want to? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Go. Yeah, I'm going from left to right. Great. So, uh, as uh, Professor Epstein mentioned, the issue comes down to uh, what. One of the big arguments is about the free rider problem that um, can occur when union, when people within the union are able to not pay for, you know, the for the dues um, or as they call it, fair share for agency costs. So I think it spins on the question of whether there is a free rider problem in this. Um, and one of the ways that economists, myself, look at this is: can they exclude non-members um, from paying and from assuming away the uh, problem of whether they have exclusive uh, exclusive bargaining agreements, then yes, we would, as, just to start the discussion, we would answer that yes, uh, groups can exclude non-members, but then they would have to give up the position of not being the exclusive bargaining, the position of exclusive bargaining agreement. So I'll start off there, and maybe that can generate some debate as to, oh, say a little bit more on that. Uh, so, the, uh, so the, the point of contention here is then that if the unions have uh, the if the unions have to if the unions have the exclusive bargaining agreement uh, that means they're the sole they have, they're the sole representation between the uh, for the employees between the employer and the employees um, then they have to represent each of the union members fairly. Um, and so they can't, therefore, if there's a dissenters, they can't exclude dissenters from enjoying the member fees, from, excuse me, enjoying the member benefits. So then the case turns on not necessarily on the free rider issue because there is not a real free rider problem from the economics, you know, based on the way that we define free rider problems in economics, it usually occurs when there's a public goods problem. And in this case, and in the public goods problem, you, it's hard to exclude non-payers, so you have to force them to pay taxes. Okay. So in this case, it's, it stems on, can they exclude non-members? Um, and the response is, so they have two solutions. Yes, they can exclude non-members. Um, if, then they have to give up their exclusive uh, bargaining agreement. But then. under the current arrangement, mm -hmm. where the union, in fact, is duty-bound 
chairman of the positive board to represent non-union members? Is there a free rider problem? Uh, if you define the free rider problem in the sense that, yes, yeah, some members are enjoying you know, the benefit without paying for it, uh, in that narrow definition, yes, but in the broader economics definition, um, no, because that what it's easy to exclude non-payers by. But, they, but they can't do it as a matter of law. Uh, if they get, they have to give up their exclusive bargaining. So essentially, under the current arrangement, though, it's clear that the union has to essentially provide benefits for these individuals. They don't have to pay for it. The question is: yes. Is there a free rider problem? May turn out as to whether or not the interests are perfectly aligned. Uh, it yes. doesn't, I think, in this case, turn on the fact that they basically can say. Uh, since you don't want to pay us, we don't deal with you. The labor situation forces the representation of yes, honor. Yes. And so you have the question of whether it's an unruly horse or an obedient horse. Sam? Um, thank you, Richard. Uh, Richard was uh, honored for being a uh, top 30, a uh, law professor of 130. I'm looking for a club called the top 70 or 70. <laughs> <laughs> I would still qualify. So I, had another I, bone, would. I would have another bone to pick with uh, uh, the esteemed Richard Epstein. Uh, the justice for whom I clerked, Justice Powell, wrote the opinion in a booth. Oh, was it? Not it Justice Kennedy, who came up a bit later. I didn't say Kennedy. Was it, was it, was it Powell? I thought oh, she wrote the concern. I thought Stewart, Stewart, wrote, Stewart wrote the opinion. And I Powell wrote a very important concurrence. I anyway, Kennedy was not a court. I didn't say Kennedy. Uh, my apologies, I must have misheard you. Uh, yes. I'm sure I did. Um, Richard said this was a fairly settled precedent, but these two, deci two decisions in 2012 and 2014 sort of like unravel everything. I think that's a remarkable conclusion about a constitutional precedent, which has also influenced a lot of other decisions. But I, I don't want to get on stare decisis because, you know, stare decisis is like beauty. Uh, if you feel it, you care about it, you value it. If you don't see it, you don't value it. It's, that, it's got that kind of opportunistic quality to it. This has been a decision been around for a great many decades and has influenced the state bar decisions and, and other decisions as well. And I don't think we have uh, the irreparable Tear in the tapestry that, that provides a you know a plausible argument for, for overturning it, um, and both Quinn and Knox involve special cases, as Richard's uh, description uh, made clear, and the court did not uh, there was not a court for overturning. It. But of course, the justices can do what they want to do. Uh, they are they are they're not they're infallible because they're final. But uh, not final because they're infallible. So anything is possible. It's, and I don't do short term predictions. But my sense from the argument is that Justice Kennedy is solidly on board to overturn some aspect of Booth. That's how I read it. And I'd be surprised. I didn't hear anything remarkably anew. A couple of things. States, you know, I'm, I'm a federalism guy, just like Richard is. The states run this show. If the states don't want to have collective bargaining, if they don't want to have a union security provision, it's in their power to change it. Uh, all, every feature of public sector bargaining, to some extent, the states hide behind uh, their inability to work here, but actually, we want, we want stronger management to make collective bargaining work. It is the politicians that have it within their power. Why constitutionalize an area where actually the states uh, are uh, fully in, in control? Um, the First Amendment, I've never understood the First Amendment. I hate NPR. I hate NPR because uh, they uh, published all this stuff, one-sided presentations of controversial issues, yet you know, they're funded in large part uh, by the government. When I was a young fellow uh, in the 60s, I was very unhappy with the Vietnamese War. Absolutely, we wanted to tear down the government. We were funding it, however. And that's the nature of government. Is if there is a public uh, goods problem, which we'll talk about in one second, you have to pay for government and work through the democratic uh, process uh, to overturn it. You don't have a right to, to object in very limited circumstances. So I don't fully understand the First Amendment argument. Um, the state could say, well, we're going to pay for all this union activity directly. Uh, people would agree that there's no First Amendment problem there. They could also say, Let, let's get a contractor who will pay for it and do all this stuff. Uh, and there'd be no First Amendment problem. Yet there's a First Amendment problem when the workers have some say in who their representative will be uh, and what the agenda for the uh, collective bargaining will be, and they pay for it. See, I happen to think that paying for representation is very important. It makes the union different uh, 
and other organizations like that different from being a depart Department of Government. So it gives the process integrity, because otherwise it would just be another personnel department. The public employers have personnel departments, which they pay for. The union is an independent voice, an independent organization. Now this brings me to public goods. I don't know if public goods is a complete justification for regulation, but it's plainly a public goods situation. Here. First, Richard points out the statutory intervention of the duty of fair representation, for sure. But even if there weren't a duty of fair representation, what unions do is inherently collective. Unions come in and they negotiate wages. That's the number one thing they do. Now, when you're dealing in a world in which there are Richard Epstein's and Samuel Zakharoff's and others, there might be some variation in the wage. But in most industrial employments, uniformity wage is critical. People care a great deal about what the guy next to them is being paid. So when I'm with the dean, I say, I don't care what you pay me as long as I get the same that a Zakharoff gets or Epstein gets. Then the dean is silent for that one. <laughs> Uh, that's all I care about. I care about horizontal equity, and I think I should want more. In another world, I might want more, uh, but at, I least, want more. at least that much. <laughs> Workers care about horizontal equity, and the union can't come in and negotiate a wage that'll be different for Maryland, <coughs> different for, for Blake, because there wouldn't then be any, one, that the union would not be able to function <laughs> in that environment, and number two, the public employer would not accomplish its goals of developing a fair wage that would motivate workers where they're not going to be engaged in all this internecine and uh, collateral activity uh, to uh, win favor with the employer. So that's the wage. What about health and safety? They're also collective goods. They can't be excluded from it. Gee whiz, we're going to have like, a safe chamber, a silo for you to work in because you're paying your dues, but otherwise you don't get it. The grievance procedure. Now it turns out that fee could be charged for the grievance procedure, but in most decisions say because of the duty of fair representation can't charge a fee. But even charging a fee for a grievance procedure is problematic because what the grievance procedure is about is enforcing the collective charter, whatever that may be. It could be a collective bargaining contract, it could be the rules and regulations of the agency. It's sort of very hard to say, a striker, I'm gonna get you a deal where you can't be fired, where you will get preference in, uh, in not being laid off, but I'm not gonna do it for Epstein because he's not paying his dues. I'm not tenured. Okay. <laughs> you are tenured. Oh my God. <laughs> But, um, and tenure, by the way, is, uh, anyway. Uh, so I think there are strong public goods arguments. It's like, I, I happen to have a house in Monterey, Mass. We have a volunteer fire department right now, which works very well. But if the town gets any bigger, and the reason it works well, there are only five families that run the town. And if these five families didn't volunteer, they would lose credibility with their colleagues. But if the town got any bigger, they would have to charge taxes for fire protection because they couldn't rely on moral suasion. Why? Because it's inherently a public good. I'm not going to run to your fire and ignore the other guy's fire. Uh, I'm not gonna ignore your fire because it's gonna affect other people. It inherently affects other people, and that is ultimately the justification for government. So I do think there's a serious public goods argument here. I think there's a weak First Amendment argument. Stare decisis is like beauty and wisdom. It's, you know, if you see it, you'll see a problem. If you don't see it, you won't see a problem. Let me offer a solution. Uh, which I think would mitigate some concerns. I'd love if to hear. Want to hold it for a second, because I want to ask you a question. Sure. Get David. The question I wanted to ask you: Do you think the democratic instinct is so strong that you would reverse the boot to the extent that it allows people to withhold, in one mechanism or another, contributions to political activities? I think the uh, the definition of chargeable activities could be modified. Uh, I don't think a boot actually, uh, the Germanus test may be a, you know, uh, a little bit spongy and malleable. So I do think there is room for a stricter uh, test on chargeability. Okay. Answer your question? Um, yeah, but I, I'm saying constitutionally. I mean, you said there's a democratic process well, become I, so strong that the First Amendment claim I is out for the political side and it's a political matter rather than Well, my understanding of a boot in the later case of Leonard uh, is that uh, these political activities can be chargeable only to the extent yeah. Uh, they further the, the collective bargaining function. Now, guess, and if they're limited in that way, I, I think there is no yeah, first time. I'm asking problem. you, would you, given your argument about democracy, would you extend the mood so that all these, that you were compelled to give both the political and the union side? Well, this is what I would do if I can offer you my proposal. I think, oh, it's, yeah. I think it's available to unions and they can respond to it. They can do it on their own. There's a provision in the Tamp Hartley Act, Section 19, that says if you're a religious objector, you don't have to pay union dues at all. You have to pay the equivalent of union dues 
to a 501c3 organization that's not involved in union activity. Um, it, now, it's limited a little bit, I would say, any 501c3 organization. Because I think you want to sever, there is a notion which people, some people feel that they're subsidizing activities of the union which may be germane to collective bargaining, germane to grievance and justice, but they just disagree with those activities. And those folks should have to, should be given the option, uh, and I've been urging this, and I think it can be done under current law, but given the option of paying the equivalent of the fee, of the fair fee, but having it go to a charity of their choice. So this deals directly with the free rider problem and I think mitigates uh, uh, the point that some people may really feel uh, uh, queasy about subsidizing activities of the union which are called political, but only within the frame of activities necessary to get the contract that's just been negotiated, ratified by the, the governor of the legislature. Okay, David. Thank you, Richard, good morning. Um, I'm coming to you folks today from uh, California where it's an interesting uh, experiment in um, the future of unionization and, and, and best test of what's, what matters in California is not what happens in the agriculture labor fields or in the uh, machine shops in El Segundo, but what happens in Sacramento. And so the first point I'd, I'd like to make or goes to the empirical point. And I personally think the whole debate that's taken place in the amicus briefs and even in the Supreme Court yesterday and, and in January of two years ago in Friedrichs about the free rider versus compelled rider, fair share versus forced speech is a little bit of a dialogue of the depth because it depends on a set of empirical uh, values, not necessarily empirical data, but values that are untested and untestable and may even not matter because Let's take, for example, what difference does it make from the perspective of the First Amendment, whether or not there will be a evisceration or, or a retreat uh, from the coffers of the union if there's a, a flight uh, once you eliminate agency fees. Well, AFSCME's big argument as part of the briefing in the case was to do a survey of 600,000 different workers and they ask them lots and lots of questions. Would you continue to pay agency fees if you weren't compelled to pay? And the answer was all but 15% said fine, we would not. So from Massey's perspective, it shows a, a, a free rider problem. Somebody wants something for nothing. From another person's perspective, it shows that the union isn't doing a very good job of making itself viable in the current environment. And that goes to some degree to the point that Professor Estrich just, uh, Estrich, Estrich. Estrich just made, which is you know, that um, there is a, an intensely complicated latticework of regulations that oversee the business of public employment. In California, we have the PER, Public Employee Relations Board. We have the State Personnel Board. We have all kinds of mechanisms and modalities to regulate classifications of jobs, et cetera, et cetera. So the idea that somehow the union is a conduit through which to negotiate or to, to, to understand better what the needs are of the workers always runs into the question of the superstructure of the government itself that is really calling the shots when it comes to wages. So where does the union really matter? As I said, it's in the city of Sacramento, our capital. Why? Because all the action in terms of the pressure that the union can place uh, on public employers takes place there. And I'm gonna tie this now back to the free rider problem. This parade of horribles that the unions are going to collapse if uh, agency fees are taken away from them. Let me just give you a few examples. There's a bill that was recently enacted in California called AB 119. And AB 119 requires compulsory uh, orientation. If you want to work at, for a state or county agency, uh, or a, a city, you're gonna ha have to submit as an individual to an orientation process whereby the union is allowed to have 30 minutes of time <coughs> outside of management's earshot to explain to you the benefits of unionization. This isn't to explain to you how the collective bargaining process works. And ASME has done, as SEIU and others, a lot of thinking about how this works. And their whole point is that if we can get them early, we can get them. And 
And there's some truth to that. In fact, in the Ask Me brief, there was a declaration filed in the, uh, in the Illinois court uh, below that was bragging about the fact that their orientation uh, uh, methodology, or which some people might call a captive audience problem, um, made a huge difference in terms of recruiting. And that takes you now to the stare decisis point, which I respectfully disagree with the professor. It isn't something purely in the eye of the beholder first. The guy who was working in the Detroit department, in the Detroit school, uh, public school in 1977, when a boot was decided, is probably long since retired. So the, the issue of stare decisis as to whom is just calls in the question, the endless cycling and changing of the law. Second stare decisis point is that those who believed in uh, the free rider concept and were willing to pay agency fees in 1977 now are asking themselves, what the heck happened to my pension? Because the city of Detroit went bankrupt. So there's a lot of moving parts within the idea of stare decisis. Se second thing is when I'm listening to this back and forth between Professor Epstein and Professor S. Stryker about lean hard and what's the dividing line, you know, that doesn't strike me as a fundamental value. Uh, it strikes me as a debate that took place in, say, 1923 when Chief Justice Taft was trying to articulate what is the public affectation doctrine, clothed in a public interest. And he wrestled valiantly to try to prop up this rusty structure. And it was a way to divide between what would be regulated and what would not. And just as Lehmark, the case that said, well, what would be regulated? Political speech versus pure, the quotidian bread and butter business of negotiating wages. It is impossible, as much as Taft realized um, soon after, uh, he wrote uh, uh, the famous uh, three-part iteration of clothed in a public interest in the Wolf case, that it really wasn't a sustainable doctrine, certainly not from a stare decisis point of view, any more than Lanehart was a sustainable dis a distinction from a stare decisis point of view. And yet, clothed in the public interest was a doctrine that hung around from Med Munn versus Illinois until um, Nebbia. It was a 40-year run, too, and it wasn't exactly missed. 60. 60 years. So I just want to close very quickly with two more uh, points, and that is, um, I, I'm not sure I would call myself a labor expert or even a labor lawyer. I've done work on both sides. I've represented uh, charter schools. I've represented the city of San Jose and the city of LA. I've represented uh, private employers, but I also had an opportunity over the last six months to represent about 600 public employees. These are probation officers and parole officers, peace officers, and public defenders who are in a fight with uh, the county of Ventura. And it really drove home to me uh, in a very poignant way that the idea that somehow governments want to help prop up unions to have a more robust collective bargaining relationship is nonsense. It's absolute nonsense. The level of uh, unfairness in the, from the perspective of the county's treatment of these professionals and the inability of the county's treatment professionals to be able to fund a, re a realistic defense against a very unfair series of labor practices po pointed out to me that the problem isn't having a better collaborative relationship between the county and the workers, because it is a fundamentally adversarial relationship. And so there is a there's plenty of room for uh, unions to voluntarily uh, get their members to want to support them in the collective bargaining process. Uh, but they have to be a reason for the workers to want. And, and so long as the counties and the cities give them a reason by being difficult or unfair or obdurate, they will come and they will support the effort. But if they don't, and if it just becomes a backroom deal between um, the union um, shop stewards and, and the folks at the middle levels of the county who've been negotiating with them for years, you have a problem of disengaged workers. And if you have a problem of disengaged workers who are just writing checks and are paying dues where the, where the dues in California get a priority over the mortgage for your kids' public education, you have a disengaged and, and an undemocratic 
David? No, I, said it was just no, I just want to ask, uh, first of all, I want to make, for some of you, I think may have not have gotten the full reference, so I want to clarify something. The phrase, affected with the public interest, um, has dropped out of American constitutional law with a decision called Nebbia in 1934. Uh, the original doctrine was started actually far back in England in the 1680s. And what it said is that to the extent you have either a legal or a natural monopoly, uh, you're the only port which can take boats even though there's no restrictions on other ports entry, but there's just no room in the harbor. The rates that you charge have to be reasonable and non-discriminatory with respect to your customers. So if an industry is affected with the public interest, it means that you can regulate the prices that the company can charge. If, in fact, the, the, the traditional view you had a purely competitive industry, that would not be regarded as affected with the public interest. And so, therefore, it would be under earlier American constitutional law and under English common law, something you could not regulate. The Nebbia case, just to make it a little bit clearer, was a situation in which they put minimum prices in a competitive industry. And you could charge, I think, something like nine cents a quart for milk. And what happened is the fellow who was subject to the price constraint uh, threw in a free loaf of bread uh, so that you knew if the bread had positive value, uh, he was necessarily uh, undercutting the public interest level for the milk. And the question was whether or not this person could be subject to a criminal prosecution for breaking back on these laws, which is why the case is Nebbia against New York instead of a dairy guy against a worker. And the Supreme Court essentially held that the doctrine of affected with the public interest allowed you to prop up rates for a competitive market, as well as this tamp down rates for a monopoly market, which is a complete transformation of the way in which the system had previously been done. And since you made that position, it meant that every industry was affected with the public interest by the time this decision was done. And that paved the way for the introduction and the legitimation just a couple of years later of uh, minimum wage and maximum hours legislation, which was sustained in 19 uh, 37 in the West Coast Hotel versus Parish case. So that's the background for it. I think you should understand. Uh, but the question I wanted to ask you, I still, when you mentioned your case, just as a clarification, and then Sam wants to jump in, is what was the actual dispute that your workers had uh, with the town? Uh, I can't figure out which workers you're representing or what I'm supposed to think of it. And when I don't have an opinion on the issue, I get very unhappy. Right, so, so <laughs> I, I'm not sure I, would you like me to speak to the fact or these yeah, just a minute or two. Yes, and then I want Sam to come. Right, so, so, so this is a, a, a issue that concerns uh, paid time off. So you're a uh, district attorney or a public defender, you're on the government payroll, you can bank leave. And pursuant to the memoranda of, of understanding their, their con CBAs, they have a deal in place where they can bank up to a certain amount of leave. And then, uh, in this case, it's 880 hours, and you have optionality. For example, you may want to accumulate leave. You, you are supposed to get like 112 hours of leave per year, and you can store it up, which many people do in the event that they have a family illness or a personal reason to take it. Others store it up because they want to cash it out as the value of their salary on an hourly basis grows. Some people call that pension spiking. Others just say it's a pure, pure uh, rational economic decision as to when you want to convert the hours into cash. The county of uh, Ventura decided under a tax doctrine known as constructive receipt that money, that, that um, hours paid, that time off banked, but not used, not cashed out, not taken as, as, a, as a vacation, has to be taxed, taxed in the year that it was accrued. And all of a sudden, these folks literally are finding themselves not just Thanksgiving, getting a note from the county of Ventura saying, by the way, we've decided in our interpretation of, of the Internal Revenue Code that all the leave that you have banked for the, for the last 12 months is taxable as ordinary income, and you won't get any money. We're going to just do exercise self-help in the form of, of garnishments of your paychecks and take the money out. As a matter of tax law, it's a very dubious concept. As a matter of due process, it's a very unconstitutional concept because of the exercise of self-help. As a matter of, fair, of, of labor bargaining, it is an unfair <laughs> labor practice because they impose a unilateral change on a, on a memorandum of understanding without actually giving, without even trying to negotiate. 
even though the folks on uh, the various labor uh, organizations try. <laughs> and so they come to us because our firm is known for having primarily a tax uh, expertise and known um, only for having very little expertise in labor, but I ended up to stick my nose in it, and that's how I ended up helping these folks. And I felt for the first time in my life I really understood that even with these very bright, accomplished professionals, the asymmetrical relationship between the, the county there and the, and the employees is, is a perfectly good example of why we need collective bargaining, why we need the protections of exclusive representation, why we need some me me mechanics for these folks to have a, a place to speak. But we don't thing, need to have it funded do, at a point of- Do these uh, people have a union? They do. They're, they are all organized. They're calling themselves associations, <laughs> but they are labor organizations recognized under state law. And they have in their uh, charter, their art Articles of Incorporation, the right to compel agency fees. In fact, of the members in um, the uh, Criminal Justice Attorneys Association of Ventura County, about, about 200 folks there, only about 20% are actually dues-paying members. For reasons having to do with for custom and folklore, they have never, the, never demanded to pull the trigger on agency fees. Okay. But Sam, they could. Did you have a comment? Well, the comment is, first of all, I'm, I'm not saying everything in the public sector labor relations is perfect. A lot of stuff needs to be changed. We can discuss that, but the way to change it is not to say that we're going to have unions that are not going to get paid for their services. Just simple elementary economics. Uh, you're going to have a diminishment of the supply of those services. And you want talented people, you don't want people that are, are crazies, and people need to get paid. Now, my uh, Section 19 of the Taft-Harley Act offers a solution, which I think can be implemented unilaterally by the unions, and that is you allow any represented employee uh, to divert uh, the union, uh, the fee that would be charged to a charity of his choice, a 501c charity of his choice. That's, that separates out the free rider problem from the subsidization problem. How do you test, how do you test the bona fides of the religious objection? I, I would not get into that. I think Tam Harley makes a mistake in saying it has to be bona fide. This is not a religious objection test. This is a, I object politically, whatever, it's not a religious objection test. It's a, I object politically to giving my money to a union organization. I have again another question. I understand how it is that it may assuage the fellow who gives the money, and what he may do is simply say, if I normally give $1,000 in charitable contributions, my union dues will now fund that. But I don't understand how the union gets support if in fact the diversion is allowed. The problem of free rider is if you don't have to pay. If you have to pay for those services, uh, in most cases you, you will pay, you'll, you'll get involved. I mean, it's gonna be the true person Right, right now there's a free ride to dissent if that vote is overturned. I'm just not gonna pay. It's like my Monterey, Massachusetts fire department. I don't wanna pay. I don't wanna pay for police services. Don't make me. Uh, you, get a, you get a diminishment of the supply of public goods services if you don't pay for those services. So this keeps that incentive in place. You, again, I'm still not sure, so I'm gonna ask the question one more time. Sure. Suppose it turns out that if we gave this option, um, nobody takes it, then nothing happens. But suppose everybody takes that option. How is the union supposed to fund its operations? I think if everyone takes that option, I think uh, the union has no support in that workforce. Now, it, 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 there is a, which I think is highly unre unrealistic because uh, there are you know, periodic elections for union representation. Um, so, I, yes, in that extreme case, there'd be no support for that union, the union walks away. But you don't have what now is a kind of what the reversal of a boot would do, would create artificial exit, because I still get the benefit of the collective goods production by the union, but I don't have to pay. Now that's a very, that's like my saying, in my town, I love you guys in the fire department, the police department, the sanitation department, I just don't want to pay. Well, you're going to get a lot of people opting into that. If on the other hand, I, I were told, well, you, you have to pay, or the equivalent to some of your fund, I think you, don't, you, you, you drive down that artificial element. So your yes. argument is that if you could do it to the charity, if you had to make the payment to somebody else, it would reduce the outflow but would not stem. Is that the position? There are going to be some people. I don't know enough about the preferences of the individual workers involved. But it would certainly stem this artificial exit, which uh, is, I think, the problem with the Abu resolution, the reversal of Abu.
Um, yeah, I, I want to bring in that maybe we're taking something for granted here, um, and that's the case, uh, you know, as that's the case that we want them to provide these public, quote unquote, public goods. Um, I think in the economics literature and in the empirical research, there's tons of, you know, we, we see the benefits that unionization create for um, workers. We see them with, you know, greater benefits and wages. But at the same time, there's a lot of empirical research about greater unionization is not necessarily the end all be all and perfect environment that we want to live in. There's a lot of uh, empirical research on unionization causing greater unionization and greater power causing greater monopoly, greater unionization power, excuse me, um, leading to um, greater unemployment, especially among women and minorities, um, and a vast number of uh, you know problems on productivity and a variety of these other things. So I think you know, as we're, as we're debating this, um, you know, we are taking that for granted. On the other, uh, on one other aspect of things to mention, um, again, I'm not a legal scholar, just come from an economic, from an, from an economist point of view. Um, Richard was, discu uh, President Epstein was discussing, Richard's fine, Richard's fine okay, um, was discussing the monopoly issue in the economic justification for unions is normally when there is a monopsony Power, and that means that um, if there's one buyer of the particular labor, in that case, uh, wagers are supposed to be suppressed below the equal, uh, below the competitive levels, and that's when we see the most productive role of unions, both in theoretically and empirically, is when there are monopsony markets. Um, in markets where are in what markets that are relatively um, more competitive, and especially in today's age in different industries and such, we can point to which industries might have more labor competitions and which ones don't. Um, there are tons of papers that look at it theoretically and empirically that unions don't play a productive role in those cases. So I think in our discussion, it's just important to utilize like which, which industries are we talking about? I know we're specifically talking about public sector here, but in general, um, do they even play a, a, an important role um, in terms of the problems that we're trying to solve, and also what other pro what other ways can we solve these problems besides unions? Okay, I'm going to ask a question again. Sam was an author of a brief, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, which I even read in preparation. Thank you, sir. I'm honored. Uh, um, you're honored. Well, wait till the question comes in. <laughs> um, but the, the question is, and I think it's, a, it's something that David hinted at and that Leah hinted at, which is the advent of public unions is around now 60 years old, close to that. And since that time, whatever the short-term situations with respect to bargaining in an individual case, uh, the long-term pension obligations that are associated with unions and also non-union labors in stations like Illinois, where this case arises from, have now reached a complete crisis point um, in which it turns out that the ability to fund uh, the pension obligations becomes so enormous, and so the question is, and uh, Sam, you can take a crack at it, David, I'd like to hear your views too, is does one think that the institution of collective bargaining in the public sector has created, exacerbated, or had no effect on the very unstable situation in a state like Illinois with respect to its pension obligations, both for the city, the various kind of county organizations, and also at the state level? Well, uh, the there are lots of reasons. First of all, I didn't say that everything the public sector unions do is good. I think it's a very strange notion. We have problems with public sector labor relations, so let's defund them in the interest of the First Amendment. It's a very strange place. Uh, so, for example, on, on David's, uh, just on David's hypothetical for one second, the bargaining units are too large in, in the public sector. They should be much smaller so that actually workers can exit and bring in alternative representation. Um, that litigation had to be funded. Presumably, it has to be funded at a union dues, or you know, that litigation would benefit all the workers. So my only point is that if you, if you have problems with public sector unionism, restructure it. So take the pension situation. By law, the legislators, and we in the public should be clamoring for it for defined contribution plans. Do all plans get shut off? Now, in some states, this is <coughs> constitutionally difficult. So we have to change constitutions. I don't know what the Illinois situation in New York, there is a constitution here. So we need constitutional change on this so that it's just a ridiculous notion that you can't change pension plans, even though I'm 70, under 70, uh, it, it, that you can't change the pension plans going forward for services provided subsequently. 
So I, I do think there's a need for change there. If you allow uh, you know, uh, one side to sort of move unchecked, well, there's always going to be a problem. So I think, for example, public sector employers should take strikes. The, the worst thing that happened was Mayor Lindsay uh, said, we're going to take a strike, but the effect was he wasn't going to try to provide transportation. You have to provide transportation to the public if you're taking a strike. So there's been a failure here. I don't think it's because Lindsay was in the public, in the, po in the, in the pocket of the public sector unions. I think it's because he you know, didn't want to take heat. Uh, for doing it. Um, politicians are cowards, but you have to take strikes if you're going to have collective bargaining. Either take strikes or put them behind bars, but you, what you can't do is wait for the public to say, I give up, I give up, which is what essentially happened uh, in the New York City transit strike. So there's a need for change. There's a need for political change, but don't blame it all on the fact that unions are, are supportive for their services. I'm, I'm just going to clarify some things. There are two references Sam has made, which some people might not get. The, uh, question about how you fund pensions, there are two basic types there. Defined contributions where you put in a sum of money and control its investment, and so there is never any residual obligation on the payer of these things after the contributions right. are made. Right. Right. Uh, we are the benefit of those situations. A defined benefit plan is that you have a certain target that has to be reached, and it turns out that the state then has to fund the money oftentimes not at the time that the work has been incurred, and defined benefits plans, uh, even when markets are good, can often create huge deficits at the end if they've been underfunded on the public which side. Which they did in the private sector which, as well. Which they did in the private sector as well. And the other reference was in January 1st, 1965, when uh, John Lindsay became mayor of New York City. Mike Quill was the head of the uh, Transit Workers Union, and he organized a rail a subway strike uh, which is still remembered by us hardline the union in the New York City. I actually ran ele election districts for uh, John Lindsay. Yeah, well, I'm maybe mistake, have, I did. he's going to reconsider. <laughs> um, okay, so anyhow, and, and so the, the problem here is quite simply, uh, in public unions that provide services, there's no way to stop, stockpile goods in advance of the thing. The day the strike begins, uh, the fact that you could take six rides to schools in the previous week is not going to help you get to school this week. So David, your views? Uh, all right, so Fred, the, the answer to Richard's question is yes. The unions have exercised profound influence over the uh, direction of public uh, pensions. And we saw this graphically in, in California beginning in 1999 with the passage of state legislation that uh, uh, created a, a 3% and 50 a 50 deal, which is that you could get up to 50% of the entirety of your salary, uh, at the age of 50 for certain public safety and, and uh, I work for fire, police, et cetera. And it grew and it grew like topsy. We were flush with cash. We had uh, a, a democratic uh, controlled uh, legislature and a pliable governor. And we bought into a system that allowed for this to happen. Number, the second thing is, is, is less discussed. And that is the extent to which unions exercise oversized influence not just in the legislature, but on pensions. So you look at organizations like CalPERS. CalPERS is the largest pension uh, fund in, in, the, in America. And you look at the composition of CalPERS, it is a very strong union presence with, an agenda, with a clear agenda. On the board? Yes, on the board. And they let their presence be known in terms of who can donate, uh, sorry, where the money gets in invested, um, and uh, how it gets invested. <laughs> Um, and without getting into too many of the details, that is a political component at work as well. The third thing I'd like to say is, is sort of on a, my own personal experience, I spent eight years on a state uh, commission. It's called the Little Hoover Commission. It was a good government, pain in the butt, kind of nosy Parker group of citizens and legislators who would meet once a month and hold public hearings and do reports. And one of the big reports that we did was on the coming pension crisis. And we concluded in 2010 that the current uh, public employee uh, pension sector, uh, pension structure was unsustainable. And this led to some reforms, but, but it was a, a, a relevant report in the public pension debate. The reason why I wanted to mention this experience is that for the eight years that I was on the commission, there would always be two CTA, California Teachers Association, washers in the room. It was like, I don't know if you remember visiting Moscow before uh, the fall of communism. There would be these 
old ladies sitting in the hallways of the hotels, and they were all KGB, they would watch you come and go, and it was a little bit like that, but we had our watchers, and then I realized after getting to know these two ladies, that they were paid for their services, they were perfectly lovely people, we had a very cordial relationship, and they were all over the Capitol. They had hundreds of watchers keeping an eye on what was going on in every committee, in every public debate, in every state event. And the fact that we know that they know, that we know that they're watching, had a profound influence perhaps on those who are worried about getting reelected. Obviously, public employee unions can command huge amounts of money. Ask Gina Ray Mondo, a Democrat running in Rhode Island, I asked her the question, how many public employees came out for you? She said, maybe 50%. She barely won, because uh, even though she's a Dem, even though she's running in a blue state, she was running on a, on a pension reform platform, and people sat home, they stayed home. So the, the influence politically of, of unions on our elected officials and in the organs of public funding, like pension, is sometimes explicit and sometimes subtle but it is omnipresent. All right, I'm gonna ask Leah one more question. Go ahead. Um, look, I mean, you're an economist, you're not always, I'm gonna ask you the big thing question. Um, one of the things that Sam mentioned in his brief was that there are two ways that you could do this. You could have collective bargaining or you could have a market in which employers, public employers are entitled, unilaterally I guess was the word, yes. to set the prices involved. So the question to you, Leah, as an economist is could one work a competitive labor market in public employment on the understanding that there'd be no collusion amongst local school districts, say for teachers, um, in order to set wages? Would that system be better than the current system that we have? Okay, so just to confirm and understand the question, can there be a competitive market for something like a school teacher? Yes, yeah, school teachers, policemen, prison guards, whatever. Yeah, so I think the way that we can um, would it, and the question is, would it be better or would it work? Both. <laughs> Both, okay. I mean, you know, you know, there's a rule that says when you're, you're asking somebody a question, they say, I don't understand if you mean A or B. What does the good lawyer always say? Both. Let's take it both ways, right? Okay. And what happens is you've now educated me to ask harder questions than I would uh, otherwise have done. <laughs> um, how about I answer the question of <clears throat> conditional mail? I'll add, um, so one, why would we want there to be competition in the first place is um, generally speaking from you know economic point of view, when we have more competition for these things, there tend to be increases in wages. You, you tend to uh, get higher wages, better benefits, and a variety of these other things. Um, and as I mentioned before, the reason that we get, the reason that unionization does solve problems and quote unquote monopsony problems is because there isn't a lot of competition for the employees, um, and therefore their wages are there's potential for exploitation of the employers, of the employees. And so uh, that's where the union comes in and solves the problem, which, you know, there's so some debate about that, right? So if we allow this type of thing to um, occur, where there is more competition for this, symbol, for this type of employee, um, then we would already see, uh, could potentially see wages and benefits and a variety of these other things increase on their own. So that it would dissolve the, the we wouldn't need the solution of unions necessarily. Um, so that's what I would say. Do wages go up or down um, um, in the short run if you got rid of monopoly power unions? So, I mean, I'm not going to be able to predict much here, but um, if you, if there's more competition for that, well, <coughs> it depends on, um, you know, if, if it's the case that the unions were, if it's the case that school teachers were holding wages, the employers were holding wages below competitive, mm -hmm. Wages, and then um, they raise it at some point either above the competitive wage or at some point below the competitive wage but above the monopsony type wages, then it could go either way. Ah, okay, well, since everything can go either way, um, do we have any questions that here? Why don't people sort of go to the microphones, ask their question? Mr. Gene Epstein, since you have the namesake of distinguished moderator of this panel, you may, you may ask the first question. Uh, before I ask my question, I feel just a brief statement that you may want to respond to is that with respect to pensions, 
With respect to pensions, I assume that private sector versus public sector. First, the private sector has moved massively in favor of defined contribution, as you would expect from the private sector, as you would not expect from the public sector. And even those public sector, private sector defined benefit plans are propped up in part by government already. So generally speaking, the private sector is behaving the way you'd expect, and the public sector is behaving the way you would expect in this regard shaft the taxpayer, uh, which is basically the principle. And so those of us who believe that uh, the union p politician combination shafts the taxpayer and shafts those people who want to consume the service, my only question from left field is, how do you feel about the charter movement? Charter school movement, which is trying to undermine the chokehold that the unions have over our schools. Uh, that would mean, by the way, to uh, ruffle the feathers of Mr. Eistrecker, that wages are actually unequal. Uh, and that <laughs> those of us who worked in the private sector find that wages are rough and unequal. I worked in the private sector for 40 years. The guy to my left and the guy to my right is generally speaking not earning what I earn. You work for a nonprofit, and I guess you're used to that equality. But my only question again is, what do you think about the charter school movement undermining the power of unions? I think Sam, the question is directed first. Uh, I'm in favor, uh, I've actually done briefs in favor of vouchers in the Supreme Court for the national lines of black, uh, option, black educational options. I'm in favor of competition. But what I'm not in favor of is an artificial reading of the First Amendment that says when you are now a union representative, uh, you have to beg for funding for your services because you're not gonna get quality services. I'm in favor of the charter movement uh, and the voucher movement. And I'm actually. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm now supposed to be immoderate, right? Could you take off your hat for the moment? Yes, I mean, my view, I'm going to answer the question since I've been forced to do this that um, Leah does in, in the following way. What happens is it's very difficult to know when you decide to remove unions whether or not wages will go up or down, as she said. But I think it's important to understand why the difference is. Um, if you're in a union structure, uh, what happens is you get a monopoly wage, but there's also a series of work rules which are quite complicated, which essentially reduces the productivity of particular workers. So when you get out of that structure, two things happen. They don't happen at the same time and at the same rate. The first thing that happens is the monopoly prop up disappears, and that means that wages ought to go down. But on the other hand, the ability of an employer to reorganize the work rules in a more efficient fashion means that the productivity gains should go. The difference in the long run between productivity gains and monopoly gains is no employer has any incentive to undercut situations where productivity gains prop up the higher wages that they pay, because they know if they go below the competitive wage, they're gonna lose a large number of their employees. On the other hand, if you are paying monopoly wages to somebody and not getting the productivity because of the work rule side, there's going to be the kind of perpetual war uh, that you start to see oftentimes. So the, the parallel would be, for example, with rent control. Um, you start putting those very heavy caps on there. All landlords want to do is to blow up the premises and get the tenants out and try to get somebody from competition in. If, on the other hand, the premises become more desirable because they're now improved by the landlord, the rents will start to go up, but you'll get an improvement in both consumer satisfaction and not. So to answer my question to Sam, uh, I'm in favor of unilateral employment offers in competitive markets. Um, what I cannot organize, and what he did not address and that I did not address, is how do you get the transition from the defined benefit plan to the defined contribution plan only start with new employees, you got 40 years to work through the system. Anyhow, David, did you have a comment on that? Um, I, 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 I do, but I'm <laughs> not sure how brilliant or insightful it is, except to say, having observed the fight between a, a, a charter school organization in, in LA and the UTLA, uh, United Teachers of Los Angeles. Right, which is, which is one of the most well-organized, sophisticated, powerful public employees. These, got, these folks are smart, and they understand, because they have said it publicly, that the charter school movement is, the, is an existential threat to them. Why? Because A, they believe that choice uh, given to parents, choice given to teachers, um, is disruptive of their monopsony or monopoly, however one wants to characterize it. 
So the big effort afoot in LA with respect to our, our charter schools is for, for you to, to figure out a way either to compel the charter school umbrella organizations to be neutral, to not take a stand, not fight or to oppose publicly the insinuation of the unions. And if they can't do that, then they will use all the instrumentalities in the legislature, in pension fund uh, arenas, and in a public employee relations board to bring cases, charges, et cetera, to attrit and wear down the teachers. Who, by the way, to your point, Mr. Epstein, made a choice to exit the public school system and to take a lower pay. Because why? They believe that they don't want to be in a system where their uh, ability to flourish, to move about, uh, to not be struck, stuck in the, under, the, 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 under the hand of the union in terms of where they can work, where they can go, et cetera. Question and then question. No, I have to. Yeah. Yes. Sure. Richard and everybody, thanks for a great panel. Michael Leroy, University of Illinois. Richard started the conversation by uh, framing it, I think, properly at 1935, an enactment of the NLRA. So interestingly, as Janice was being argued to the Supreme Court, West Virginia teachers were on strike yesterday. Uh, they don't have collective bargaining. They don't have dues. Uh, they're voluntary members. Uh, but they have an organization that speaks for them. And they've gotten fed up, and they walked off the job after four years of being unhappy with a dialogue with the state legislature. So here is my question. We're 20 years down the future. However Janice comes out, there will be more attempts to um, take power away from unions and to uh, delegitimate and um, um, put them back, in my opinion, uh, and I'm asking for your opinion on this, at a place where they existed prior to 1935. And in fact, in some jurisdictions, were treated as a criminal conspiracy. So my question is, uh, do teachers in West Virginia have a First Amendment right of association sufficient to protect them against um, the possibility of being treated as a criminal conspiracy? David, do you have an answer? Uh, first, um, thank you for that question, and thank you for bringing us back to Richard's introduction. I, this is a subject of great importance to me and I think to the future of unions, because I think this whole dialogue has painted the union in, in it's a very you know, Manichaean terms of good versus evil. In fact, the real fundamental problem is the problem of freedom of association. The, the, and, it, and it's a democratic problem, so we're here talking about law and liberty. The fundamental, uh, most un troubling aspect of this debate, and what has happened since 1935, is the collapse of the concept of, of democracy in, in labor relations. The, the premise of the NLRA was that you would have majority, majority rule. Um, the Supreme Court said in, in the J.I. case in 44, I believe it was Justice Jackson, that that is the concept uh, that we invest the legitimacy in the union. As long as it, if we, the workers can choose as long as the union does not create barriers to uh, block their ability to choose or remove the rascals if they want them out, that we have confidence in that the union structure is like a legislative structure. It is allowed to exercise the power uh, given to them by those who chose the representatives to make choices in all different areas. And so yes, to the question about freedom of association, if that ability to organize, to dissent, to change the representation or to decide not to have one at all is disruptive, then it is the state that is imposing a suppression of speech. So, and this is what is missing from this discussion in the Supreme Court and elsewhere. Consider all the ways in which the statist solution to stability or to more cooperative negotiations or to better outcomes is to ossify and entrench the incumbent unions. To Professor S. Dreyer's point, there have periodic elections and public employees. I would beg to differ. An election in a, in, a pu in a public employee sector is a rare, rare thing. It is very difficult to get a decertification movement going. They have internal elections, to be sure. Yeah, but those are all about, you know, who's gonna be the guy who's gonna cut up the cake. This is about whether or not the dissenters actually want to look at the world differently. 
And, uh, and just, just, I'm sorry, just, just forgive me one, one more last point, and that is, look at how the NLRB, in, in a case called uh, Lemon's Gasket, is, is actually making it harder and harder for uh, employees to decertify, because they're imposing uh, um, uh, contract bars and decertification election bars uh, that are literally blocking the ability of workers to make a choice as to whether to oust or re-up uh, re the union. And I think that's where the focus ought to be. Sam? Well, I agree there needs to be more democracy in, in the public sector space. And you know, that's why I say we should have smaller units, for sure, because those units are impossible to deserve. I believe in an exit option within the union situation. I've written about it in the private sector as well. Uh, but there is more democracy, actually, in, in the union structure than are in many workplaces. Um, Anyway, what was it? You have a comment? Okay. She's good. I'm good, too. Hello, uh, Lance Wodek, retired attorney. Thank you for your panel today. Of the concerns that you raise, can you address how Wisconsin has played out? It seems that they've experienced many of the things that you are talking about this morning. I'll comment on that. On this, somebody? It seems as though the experiment, quote unquote, has worked. Uh, in the sense that if you try to look at the balanced budget implications, the level of performance among students, um, property taxes and so forth, all those things have moved for the better. Union representation is sharply down in the state in virtue of the fact that there's no longer any obligatory situation. I think it's fair to say that um, there is not likely to be in the short run any reversal of this situation. I think the electorate is actually pleased with the way in which the situation is operated. Um, that, so, as Sam said at the beginning, is a political decision, hard fought and so forth. But I think it's likely to be permanent. There's a more general point to be made here. It, this is a huge tug of war between two sides. But unlike many other areas of American life today, uh, the unions at this particular point are on the defensive, not on the offensive. They were on the offensive in 2009 when they tried to get the Employee Free Choice Act put into place, which was blocked, much to everybody's surprise, but nonetheless, that blockade held. Now I think all the pressure is moving in the opposite direction. This is a glacier moving slowly. Uh, this is not a speed engine going down the right. I think that's the way you would say things stand. Uh, so, um, disagreements? Okay. Uh, uh, Mario, do you have a question? Oh, yeah. uh, we have one more question, and then we'll, we're going to have our keynote address at 1030. So um, it will give everybody on the panel a chance for a final remark, and then I'll deliver the 20 minute peroration. Okay. Uh, I'm Mario Rizzo, the, <coughs> the biased moderator of the next panel. Um, <laughs> From an economic perspective, I'm an economist, uh, this, there's something very awkward about this discussion because there's a certain background where we're not supposed to question the benefit of unions because it's legislated and all that. So, as I say, from an economic perspective, it's awkward. Uh, but I, it, it strikes me that the, the free rider problem becomes the cartel enforcement problem when we're dealing with producers. If we were to think of companies in a sort of cartel arrangement to keep prices up, uh, and they had some kind of an agreement whereby each one of the firms uh, had to contribute to some fund that would uh, ensure the existence of the cartel, uh, we would look at it a lot differently because the cartel of producers is not considered to be sacrosanct as the cartel of workers. But nevertheless, um, that just from an economic perspective, it somehow doesn't make sense. Um, but let me point to two things uh, since uh, economics was the, the free rider problem was brought, was brought up. In the public goods literature, in addition to there being a free rider problem, there's something called the preference revelation problem. And that's the question of whether uh, individu the individuals who are supposedly, supposedly provided the public good uh, want that good. Uh, if that's the kind of good they want, uh, the quantity they want, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and uh, that's an, a problem that comes about because attempts to s solve the free rider problem make it harder to have a preference revelation uh, in, in, in the case. So we have to deal with the question of preference revelation as, a, as a, uh, another factor uh, involved. Secondly, 
you know, we talk about public good, but how wide is the public here? Uh, if the cartel arrangement is instructive, because uh, if you define the public as the interests of the cartel members, uh, then, you know, it's a public good. Uh, but if you define the public here as just the interests of the, uh, of the, uh, of the unions or the workers, and not to include the, the interests of the taxpayers, uh, then, uh, you know, it's, it's not clear they're providing a public good. They may be providing a public good to their members, but a public bad to the public at large. So there are a lot of unquestioned uh, um, aspects of this. I think the most important one is the uh, pre preference revelation problem, uh, and that uh, there seems to be no interest in whether the, the unions are truly representing uh, the workers or whether they are acting in the true public interest. Any comments? Um, well, one of the reasons I favor of more democracy in the public sector and the private sector is I think will help with that preference revelation problem. The unions do have tons of meetings with their members to find what they want on the bargaining agenda. But there's going to be a principal agents problem, uh, as there is in every organization. Uh, on um, the public, in it, uh, what, what's the public in public goods? The taxpayer is represented by the government not by the beneficiaries of this organization. If the government is the manager. The government is the one that you should be looking to blame and, and to uh, vote out the rascals. Do um, you have a comment? No, I agree with that. Economists agree. Economists agree. Do you have a comment, David? I do. Um, not too long. The price of democracy and public participation in the uh, priorities of the union shouldn't be paid to play pay us either by compelling agency fees, or by compelling dues if you want to have a voice in the room or a seat at the table. It should be the other way around. We invite you into a participatory process where the unions get to decide what their uh, interests are. And if their interests and your interests are the same, then you'll want to fund it. And this segues, I hope, into the discussion that you guys will have, which is look at the history of unions and their response to labor and immigration quotas beginning in the early 20th century. And the unions took, depending on what union, anti-immigration positions. We saw it in, in a variety of settings. Even the, you know, the UFW was uh, virulently opposed to immigration, legal or illegal, because they saw uh, workers coming across the border as scabs, and they sent folks down to the so that's a policy choice made by a parochial set of interests, not in the public. Okay, we're going to have a speech. I'm going to end it with one observation, sage as it may be. <laughs> the intellectual problem that we have here on the legal side is when we're dealing with general economic relationships, we have a very low rational basis test which allows the political system to dominate. The First Amendment, we have a higher standard. And if we could keep the two main domains separate, then everything looks fine. But when we mix them together, what we do is we get genuine confusion and disagreements on various kinds of things. And on that harmonious note, I think we should end on time and uh, let our keynote addresser uh, proceed at his own peril to the platform. Thank you.